Hey everybody, Jennifer Bleen here. We are talking about counterintuitive advice. It's almost like rubbing a cat the wrong way. It kind of makes you cringe a little bit, maybe maybe even nails on a chalkboard. That's what we're going to be talking about today. My guest is Dr. Sean Dill. He is a certified uh, book Yourself Solid coach. He's been featured in Forbes and uh, the Inc. 5000. He and his wife wrote a best-selling book, and he is all about about helping service providers live a, a great business, create the lifestyle of their dreams. And he's going to be at my event coming up in May. So Sean, thank you so much for being with us today. My absolute pleasure. Hopefully we can uh, share some great nuggets and some tips, even if you're not coming, but you should be coming. But just by watching this video, uh, hopefully we can uh, put some people on a new path uh, and point them in a new direction a direction where they can have hope, where they can get through some of the things that are going on in the economy and their business, all of that and more. So hopefully everybody will uh, grab some popcorn, settle in, grab a notepad, take notes. Can't wait to uh, see what we uncover. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I want to start with this count, the concept of counterintuitive advice. And so this is one thing that you talk about a fair amount is that if you knew how to overcome today's business challenges with the advice you'd been given to date, you would have solved those challenges. And so you say something like all business, all good business advice is counterintuitive advice or something to that effect. Refresh my memory on how you explain that. Yeah, I feel like all great business advice should seem counterintuitive, at least at first, right? Because your intuition is what got you here. Mm -hmm. And I talked to a uh, I talk to business people all over the, the world, in fact, in all different types of industries. And if we're talking to, there is a, a select few of people that are super happy with where they are, right? Like they love what they've built and you know, they, their concern is how do I make sure that I keep it here? The rest of the people that I talk to, which is the overwhelming majority, they want to grow. They want more. They want to reach more people. They want to make a bigger impact. They want to improve their lifestyle. And what I always tell them is, well, your intuition got you here. In order to go to the next level, don't you think that we would have to do some things that are counterintuitive? No, I'm not saying just wake up and do the craziest thing you could think of. But when you do get really great advice, of course, it's going to seem counterintuitive because it's not what you've been doing. What you've been doing has gotten you here. And if we modify, obviously that's counterintuitive. And so the first thing that we're looking for in today's conversation, I think everybody just needs to ask themselves, you know, that me saying that all great business advice is going to be by nature counterintuitive is a call to action to ask you, are you open-minded, right? There's mm -hmm. open-minded people and there's closed-minded people. So for today's discussion, if you are not open-minded, I can assure you that you will get nothing out of the rest of your time with us because you're not open-minded. You have to ask yourself, you know, first of all, do I have an open mind? And, and if not, like, can, can I open my mind to new ideas, new suggestions, new ways of looking at things, new ways of doing business, um, doing things outside the box because everything inside the box is what's gotten me exactly to where I am right now. I love it. So let me follow up with this question then. Can you think back to a time where you got advice from one of your mentors, one of your coaches that on the surface felt counterintuitive? Uh, maybe a piece of advice that you followed that turned out really well for you, your business, your lifestyle. I think putting concrete examples around it could help. Well, um, and I don't know if we'll dive into, but I'll just briefly tell you um, first of all, just hiring mentors was counterintuitive. I mean, I knew that I wanted to have mentorship, guidance, wisdom in my life. Um, you know, there's a difference between coaching and mentorship. Coaching doesn't mean necessarily that somebody has done the thing, especially if you look at like in sports. There's a lot of great coaches that haven't won the championship or necessarily even excelled on a professional level in the sport that they're coaching. Um, but they know how, they have the understanding of the know-how, and they have the ability to communicate the, the how-to to the people, to the players. And that's what makes them a good coach. Um, mentorship typically is going to come from somebody that's actually done it, right? And so mentorship is, I've already been there. Let me um, counsel you and provide you with wisdom so that you don't necessarily have to make the same mistakes that I made. And then we could accelerate 
your learning curve and you can get there faster, thereby creating leverage. Well, I always have seen the value in this, but that doesn't mean that I always had the money to pay for it. Um, I remember early on, I worked with Michael Port, the author of the New York Times selling best selling or best selling book, um, Book Yourself Solid. At a time when I, that was my first, one of my very first coaches, my first coach that I paid significant money to that I really couldn't afford. But I knew that, you know, and this is so cliche, like I couldn't not afford it. Like I couldn't afford to not work with him. But like, seriously, I didn't really have the money. I like barely had the money to engage him. And then that got me going. Um, and then I made the leap from Michael to Jay Abraham, which is mm -hmm. a big leap in price structure. Um, when we started working with Jay, we did a half a day of consulting with him at his office in Torrance. And the, the, the example that I thought of is he, um, and I tell this story a lot, he, he was listening to me and he was like, Sean, you need to write a book. And I must have made a face um, because he said, he said, I can tell already that you don't like the idea. And I was like, well, it's not that I don't like the idea, but like, I just can't even envision myself writing a book. And he was like, but Sean, there's a lot of ways that you could write a book, a lot of ways that we could get this done and a lot of benefit that the book could bring to you. And I was like, oh, I've seen so many of my colleagues and, and friends write books that nobody reads. Like, well, what's the point of writing this silly book? Um, that was a counterintuitive piece of advice that actually, just a few months later, I happened to meet uh, Tucker Max uh, through Tristan Schaub at a conference. And so he introduced me to Tucker Max and we started talking about writing a book. I was like, oh my gosh. And Tucker was like, I can make this really easy for you. We write the book, None of Your Business with Scribe and Tucker. Um, it goes on to be an Amazon bestselling book. It's been out for several years and still continues to do very well. And, you know, that was a piece of counterintuitive advice. I'll give you another one just real quick that I have not acted on. So that was one I took action on. New, uh, Amazon bestseller has done really great for our business. One that I haven't yet acted on. Um, I actually just spoke about this today in the podcast that I released into our membership group. As I was speaking to a, a young man, JC Height, in the social media space. And JC was telling me, I was like, well, we were just having a conversation. It wasn't a sales call, but I was just talking to him. And I was like, what would you do for my brand? And he was like, well, to be honest with you, I wouldn't do I wouldn't do any ads. I was like, what? He goes, yeah, it's funny coming from a guy that doesn't do any ads. He goes, but I would do SEO. And I said to him, I said to him, why would I do SEO? Who in the world is going to wake up in the morning and Google Sean Dill? Now, everybody watching this right now, you are all saying the same thing. Like, what, why, like, who, who is this guy? Like, you weren't trying to go, maybe you're Googling now. Like after the fact, because you're like, oh, who is this with Jennifer? But nobody wakes up and is like, I'm going to Google Sean Dill. And J JC was like, yeah, but we could create organic searches. And I was like, what is that? He's like, well, if we SEO'd you in interesting SEO categories, like maybe you want to be the most successful Asian business consultant. Like what if I what if I came up number one for that? Then I would go on on, on appearances like this and I would go on other podcasts and other media and I would tell people. And I would put in my bio, Sean Dill is known as the most successful Asian consultant. And there's a lot of other Asian consultants, by the way. I can think of a lot of really um, notable ones. But if I was SEO'd for that, and I bet those other guys are not SEO'd for that. And then I said to you, Jennifer, don't believe me? Google it. <laughs> I would cause people to organically search this. And I would come up number one. And Google, in everybody's mind, tells the truth. It's a big validator. That one I have not yet put into place because I was just told it, but that's counterintuitive because I was having a conversation and I was like, that doesn't make any sense. What do you mean run no ads? And he was like, yeah, we should SEO. And I was like, that makes even less sense. And he was like, well, you don't understand what we would do to get the, the traction. And I was like, well, that makes a little bit of sense, but I still don't know how this is going to help me. That's counterintuitive advice. And I think everybody with that example, I think that's a great example, can say to yourself in your back of your mind, like, yeah, that's pretty good advice. I would have never thought of that. No. And it's counterintuitive. That was, oh. That's what makes it so good. So I, I love it. Unknowingly, you just touched on the very reason that I invited you to come to my event. Um, and it's because you, you 
think differently than I think almost anyone I've ever met. Like you're willing to say, okay, that doesn't make any sense, but I'm talking to someone who clearly knows their craft. So help me see what you see. So um, we could go into a whole sales conversation where you threw out an objection and, and they overcame that objection, helped helped you understand what you were missing. But if, if you're listening to this right now and you are in the IT space or even the service space and you are looking to get to that next level of success and you realize, okay, the things that I've done to get me where I am today are not going to be enough to get me to where I should be, to where I want to be, to, to get over this next hump that's coming, which we'll probably talk about in a few minutes, then make sure you get your tickets. Uh, go to mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate. It is the ultimate IT growth conference. Sean is going to be speaking on day two. I'll be speaking on both of the days. It is two full days of packed information that you are not hearing anywhere else. And so it's it, this is, it, by the way, this is not going to be a massive show with 1,500 people. This is a nice intimate show where you can actually dig in and get answers from the keynote speakers, have conversations with the keynote speakers. No one is going to be whisked away by their handlers. No one has bodyguards around them. This is a chance for you to come work on your business, get it elevated, to the point where where you want it to be and then some. This is going to be a transformative event. So get your ticket, mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate. So Sean is one of the speakers that's going to be there. And Sean, you just touched on something else that is, it's one of your um, your claims to fame, one of your pillar, uh, pillar pieces of content, if you will. And it's about relationships. So you were just talking about the gentleman who gave you counterintuitive advice. That would never happen if he didn't feel like he had enough of a relationship with you to challenge you with your thinking, to challenge you. So, so talk to me a little bit about relationships and why you feel like they're so, so powerful and almost magical. Well, first of all, we just lived through a period of time, um, this pandemic, when things really were kind of flipped upside down. And when that started, um, I began to counsel and teach the clients that I serve that relationship capital was going to be the currency. Everybody wanted to know, like, you know, we're printing money, and cryptocurrency. And I was like, don't worry about any of it. Worry about having a strong, a strong Rolodex full of relationships that can help you get back in, in, in the game. And so here, you know, people have always, I get the question a lot, like, what if you lost everything? What would you do? And I always say, well, I define everything. Um, I would be fine if you took everything but my phone, right? So if I had my phone, um, I'm back in business because I have I have people's names and emails and phone numbers and I can lean on those relationships. I also think that one of the things I, I would love to develop um, when we're there live um, is to talk about how relationship capital transacts. We live mm -hmm. in a world where, you know, there's these networking groups and there's all this, you know, even we talk about like giver's game, but we don't really understand the, the transaction in relationships. So relationships are the currency. And then we have banks, right? Um, we have these people that we can deposit relationships into and we can actually get an ROI. And we do that by making introductions, doing business with, investing our relationship capital into. And I think that's the missing ingredient. Most people just think that they just see it very transactionally. Like I give you business, you give me business. And that's not actually how it works. And it's very hard because it's not ever one-to-one -one. What if my business or the thing I sell is $10,000 and the thing you sell is 1,000? Well, you wouldn't feel in fair exchange with me unless I brought 10 clients to you for every one that you brought me. But what if I was bringing you three relationships, right? So you brought me and those three relationships ended up creating opportunity for you to do more, more business. I then become a bank because you're investing into me and I am providing an ROI onto you. And I tell people, look, I, I my goal with all of these conversations and appearances and the work that we do is to become a bank for anybody that wants to. And I, I've invested a lot of time in, in, in being a person that's not necessarily putting myself out there on the marquee all the time. I think a lot of people would be super surprised the relationships that I manage, the the people that I talk to on a regular basis, and and the relate, and in, and then I think they're more surprised when they hear those other people talk about me, and then they're like, 
you know, I've done business deals with people that they were trying to court somebody and the sort of the big name in the deal has said, but I'm not doing the deal without Sean. Well, that's relationship capital. It's not actually money, but it's just because we're tied together through relationships. So I think if we can learn how to leverage relationships, then the next step is that we can actually then create business, which, you know, there, there's a step. Everybody wants the business without the relationship, but you have to invest. You have to know um, what relationships you want. You have to know how to get those relationships. You have to know how to provide value into those relationships. You have to identify which relationships are transactional and which people are banks. And then we have to invest heavily into the bank so that we can create an ROI. When we get the ROI, that's when we get the business. And that's when you're like, wow, I can't believe how much revenue I'm creating. I can't believe what's happened to my lifestyle. I can't believe what opportunities, invitations are coming my way, all because of the relationships that I've created. I, I love it. And so for people who follow me, you hear me talking all this time about determining what lever you need to pull and pulling those levers in the right order. And if you are not investing in relationship capital, if, if what Sean just shared makes sense on the surface, but you're saying, I'm just not sure I really understood what he said. Believe me, I have heard him say it about five times and I'm starting to get it. I, I want him to, to park on that ROI, hopefully at the event, because ROI is not always about money. And, and so I think that's sometimes the challenge is that you're, you're, you're still thinking in that BNI chamber mentality. Who can I find to network with that can give me a referral? And that's not the right mentality. And so if, if you're saying, okay, I, I kind of get this relationship thing, I sort of understand it, then come so that you can get a deeper understanding. Come to my event, get your ticket today, mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate. It is the ultimate IT growth conference. And I promise you, people are going to be talking about this event. And if you don't come, you are going to kick yourself. I, I have never let you down. So please make sure you get your ticket, mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate. So Jennifer, sure, I me, want to be, yeah, wait, go ahead. Before you go to the next question, you can edit this. So I'm going to make this so you can edit this and then we can we can push this out. You put, put this as a paid um, piece of content out there, but I'm going to give, I'm going to give everybody something I think that you should do. We teach this idea called having a board of advisors. This was passed on to us through Jay Abraham. So let's say that you identify five people. So these aren't referral partners. This is your board of advisors that could help you to grow your business. If they took the time and effort to pull some of those strategic levers on your behalf. And you told them, like, let's say you wanted me and you're, I'm not in, I'm, I'm not an MSP. I don't have any business interests that are in that realm. So you're like, there's no conflict, Sean. Would you be willing to serve as, as one of my advisors? And I was like, sure. And you were then you were like, great. So here's how it works. Twice a year, I ask you to do a one-hour call with the other members of the board. So not one-on-one. -on -one. There's other, I have I have five advisors. So you and four other people and me, and we'll talk a little bit about my business, some of my challenges, and see if there's any areas that you might offer some strategic advice. And what I do is I pay a stipend. Um, you know, it's a, it's a nominal fee. You don't have, it doesn't have to be a lot. I pay, I pay each member on the board, uh, $500 a year, thousand dollars a year. Plus I, I, I allocate some of my growth, a percentage of my growth back into my advisors. So the more, I mean, and I do it just sort of randomly based off of your contribution, the bigger your contribution, the more I allocate to you, which is another concept that we could talk about at some point, giving away equity in exchange for growth, right? If you knew you could, you could get there. But then let's say I agreed to do that. And then you got me on a, on a, on your board call and you were like, you know, one of the big challenges that we're having is we are trying to break into certain entrepreneurial circles. So I was wondering if anybody on my board knew, let's say like Jay Abraham, or maybe could connect me with, you know, Dave Meltzer or Patrick Bet David, or I don't know, Jordan Belfort. Like these are the people I'm trying to connect with, but you knew I was on the board and you knew I had those contacts. Well, I'm going to say, um, yeah, I'd be happy to do that because I'm on your board. I'm on the board of advisors. One way we could one way we could do this is be very strategic about our relationships by creating a board of people, not just as referral partners that can open up windows and doors and avenues for you to grow your business. If you would just put that into place, I am positive that we can grow your business to exponential levels that will more than justify you coming to this event with us in Orlando. 
I love it. Uh, such a great gold. And that is just a taste of what you're going to get at this event. So if you don't have your ticket yet, go to mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate and get your ticket to the ultimate IT growth conference. Okay, Sean, one more question for you. So obviously one of your superpowers seems to be aggregating data where you, you take data from different um, disparate sources and you pull it together and you somehow you create gold that nobody else is seeing and nobody else is talking about. And you see these trends sometimes three months, six months, a year before anybody else is. Um, you, you've you got a, a knack for that. People that know you well know that that's what you do. So put yourself into the role of a managed service provider for a minute and look at, at not just that industry, but what you're seeing in the world and in, in the economy. You mentioned crypto. What is some of the advice that you would give to an MSP if you were talking one on one to them right now? Well, it's a super scary world, right? And, and you are correct. I, I aggregate a ton of data. I, I look at a myriad of sources, a myriad of viewpoints. I am fairly apolitical. Um, I'm one vote. I recognize that, you know, I can't control the politics of a country or even the world. Um, and, and from an MSP's perspective, listen, man, every I think every other day, at least right now, um, you're going to see something on the news about a potential um, hackers or, 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 or um, hacking of very delicate and important systems in the world. I mean, there's, you know, before we had the, um, the coronavirus, we had some uh, simulations that were run on a spread of a coronavirus. Well, we've run simulations on um, what would happen if, you know, Russian or China hackers took down, for example, our internet system, our banking system. Well, this is on the macro level. But what's happening is on the micro level, everybody is beginning to be exposed to that. No longer are we worried about just threats on the macro because we keep so much, every business keeps so much information on the IT side. Um, like your, most businesses that I deal with can't function. Like, like, so it's not like it's like, I mean, and I know like, well, my printer's down and that could be a call, like the network is down. But I mean, the reality in people's minds of like something could royally go wrong on a macro or on a micro level. So the value is being preached for you. I don't think that MSPs are really extrapolating those pieces of, of news and current events um, and applying them down into their micro level. Like what would this is? Sure, like that would be terrible if it happened to the banking system, but what happens if it happens to Sean Dill's business? Even in my business, that would be, de that would be devastating, potentially more devastating than the pandemic. So number one, we've got to be better at communicating value by leveraging current events. And, and this is a great time. I would be sharing blog posts and social media content with opinions relative to all of this stuff that is happening. Um, people are familiar in, in the world today with because it's on the news with groups like Anonymous. Right. And so we're like, oh, Anonymous and they might do this or might do that. But what if it happened on a smaller level? The other thing. Um, the value that is assigned to this now is so much bigger. So I would be looking at, you know, assigning a large value. I would be using case studies too to show people where, you know, an hour down or a day, 24 hours down, or this type of issue happening in your IT, how that extrapolates into lost revenue. Um, and not just during the time period of the downtime, but also long term lack of referrals, lack of compliance, retention dropping people. And um, we even had recently during the pandemic, I think it was the Zoom outage. Um, um, there should have been white papers done on what the stock did that day during the Zoom, during one day of Zoom outage. What happened to their stock? And what did that mean to the bottom line of this company? And that's Zoom. Everybody's like, well, of course that's Zoom. But what if it was you know, your particular business? And what would that mean to you? So a percentage of that back in basically as an insurance policy to have somebody in your back pocket that's there to, one, mitigate the, the problems before and prevent problems before they happen, two, to jump in if you are having a problem, what would that be worth to you? Lastly, I would be looking at payment solutions because you know I would definitely be looking at recurring payments that just people are buying in the background as an insurance policy for keeping their business up. And every single day, even though like they might not interact with you, but that they see the news and they're reminded of the threat, they're reminded of the potential and the possibility. 
it, it reinstills in them the value that you're bringing to them. And you don't actually have to be constantly calling them and reminding them how valuable, how valuable you are because social media and the news and the regular media is doing that for you. This, I think, opens up massive doors for you to create new opportunities, new pricing structures, and even new services that could be provided to people because of the perception that is shifting away from just, you know, um, I'm just bringing somebody in to make sure my computers are working right to now this is a bigger scale. This is this is actually, in my mind, much more like an insurance um, policy that I'm, I want to have on my business. Because of that, and you mentioned that earlier as well, Jennifer, I would begin to emulate and mimic insurance companies relative to marketing, sales strategies, what they do, because it's the same sort of genre, but people don't think of the product or service in that way. But I can begin to shift it by doing that. I always remind everybody, listen, the drive through was originally a banking concept that then was applied into the restaurants and the fast food. And now today, when I say drive through, you first think fast food. Um, the same thing here, if we can begin to spot these trends, we can emulate the other markets that own that, that own the marketing and sales because it was their bread and butter. But as the trend starts shifting towards that, we can begin to bite off some of what they're doing, apply that into our business, and then we will find similar success because it's tried and true, which brings us full circle, but it's not intuitive. Because a lot of people will say like, Sean, but that's not what we do in MSP. Like you're now you're out there in Crazyville. It's not an insurance policy. Okay, I get it, but it's like an insurance policy. Your people want the assurance that they are protected. And if you are if you're providing a service that provides that assurance, then it's one letter or two letters away. Like it's insurance. It's like I'm being insured against the potential negative effects that could happen if, if the eventuality that this may happen to me. And if it never happens to me, which I hope I'm never in a car accident, I hope I never use my health insurance, and I hope I never need to employ MSPs because of some crisis. I want to use them you know, on the day-to-day -day because of growth or because of, but you have the ability to charge in the, in the consumer's mind to prevent the crisis, right? And I think that that's a massive opportunity, especially with what I'm seeing coming down the road over the next probably two more years. Amazing. Okay, so we got a little hint of future casting from Sean Stradamus. That's his, that is his nickname among those who know him well. So we've talked about relationships. We've talked about all big, great business advice being counterintuitive or at least seeming counterintuitive and then giving you a little taste of some ways to market your cybersecurity um, offering, to sell it, to prove the value of it. And so that is a small taste of what you're going to get at this event. Make sure you have your ticket, mspsalesrevolution.com slash ultimate. It is going to be the ultimate IT growth conference that everyone will be speaking about. So Sean, thank you so much for your time today. I so appreciate it. And I can't wait to see you in about three weeks. I can't wait to be there. Listen, I hope that people will take advantage of your offer. Also, I want to reiterate what you had said earlier. I too have put on um, some of these larger type events with some big name people. Sometimes the, the speakers are absolute jerks, but I've seen your lineup and no jerks on the lineup, which is great. What that means is that speakers are hanging out, speakers are available, Take the, they will take the time. I'm telling you, I, I've seen the list. They will take the time to talk to you, to sit with you, to answer any questions. And look, this is an opportunity because the lineup is so great um, to get some of that value, that coaching, that mentorship at way less than most of these people would charge because they're there for, for Jennifer. They're there for the program and they're there for you. So make sure you jump on this opportunity. It would be a shame. This is what I've said to um, information. This is great. I love sharing with you. And we shared information. Information can be transmitted via social media, even from the stage to you. But transformation actually takes you getting up off your couch. I've never seen anybody be transformed sitting on their couch or sitting at their desk watching a video. You've actually, you actually have to have movement, and we can talk about that. I know Dave Meltzer's on the program. You have to assign the movement, actually, to create the transformation in you. If you want to transform your life and your business, you've got to show up in Orlando, and then we'll do the rest. Amen. I love it. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Have an amazing rest of the day, and see you in Orlando.